All right. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to share with you a vision uh, from the robotics community. Robots, uh, they're leaving the factory floor. Uh, they're already in our hospitals. Very soon, they'll be in our schools, our homes. We'll be living with robots, working with them side by side. Uh, they'll be looking after caring for the sick, uh, the elderly. If you suffer a physical disability, you could eventually be wearing a robot. It could assist you with motor tasks like, uh, say, walking uh, or grasping. This is the vision. This is what roboticists call co-robotics, or robots that cooperate with humans. And if you're like me, you find this re really cool and, and exciting. Uh, for the rest of you, though, I mean, it might be a little bit unsettling, this idea of human-robot interaction. Because let's face it, right? I mean, robots, they're, you know, they're big, they're, they're hulking, uh, they can be pretty menacing. I mean, the idea of something like this in your, in your kitchen, <laughs> I mean, it's completely terrifying, right? And to some extent, it should be, because when it comes to human-robot interaction, there is a fundamental problem with the way that robots are engineered, and that is that they're made with materials that are completely on the wrong end of the spectrum when it comes to elastic rigidity. Robots, they're made out of rigid materials, hard plastics, metals, semiconductors. In contrast, we're made out of soft materials, right? I mean, your like, natural skin, your, your muscle tissue, your organs. In biomechanics, they would call this a pretty severe case of impedance mismatch. Whatever you want to call it, the fact is that if we want robots uh, to be safe for human interaction, uh, if you want a wearable robot that's comfortable, that doesn't constrain your natural motion, if you want an implantable robot uh, that, uh, doesn't, uh, that preserves your uh, natural bodily function, that doesn't damage your internal organs, then we really need to re-examine the types of materials that we use in robotics. What we need are essentially soft robots. And, and this is just one kind of extreme example of a soft robot out of Harvard University. Um, this is powered through air inflation. And now, the idea of powering a robot through inflation, that's not new. It's been around for decades. What is new, though, is now we can build robots like this using rapid prototyping tools in a matter of hours uh, or minutes. You'll, you'll notice uh, that there's some uh, pneumatic tubing. Uh, this robot is tethered. What you don't see in this video uh, is all the off-board external uh, hardware, the, you know, the pumps, the compressors, the valves, the electronics. Um, for soft robots uh, to be fully autonomous, so for them to be independent, for them to interact with the environment and humans in meaningful ways, we have to get that external hardware on board. Um, we have to address what I think of as grand challenges in this new field of soft robotics. We need artificial skins, artificial nervous tissue. Um, take that robot I just showed you. Suppose, instead of filling it with compressed air, we filled it with conductive fluid. Then you would have a circuit that would remain intact, it would remain electrically functional, even when we stretch that surrounding rubber to, say, 10 times its natural length. Okay, so soft, elastic, basically squishy uh, circuits and, and sensors. Artificial muscles, not just for reversible shape change, but also for reversible rigidity tuning. If you think about it, just like our natural muscle, right? When it's passive, it's, it's soft and limp, and when it's active, it's rigid and capable of exerting a lot of mechanical force. We also need modeling tools. Um, something that surprised us with that soft quadruped robot that I showed you was that for the same undulatory gait, this robot would move in completely different directions depending on what type of surface it was crawling on. So when it was crawling on felt, it would move forward. When it was crawling on wet gelatin, it would move backward. And on plastic, like polyethylene, it would actually not move at all. Okay, So very surprising, not at all intuitive, but a property that we can actually predict using classical theories in engineering. So Engineering it just has a really rich set of tools uh, to, to help us kind of avoid, uh, uh, just to, to kind of explore and navigate this vast space of possible designs, materials, uh, geometries, uh, control strategies. Now, engineering alone is not enough. Uh, we as engineers need to continue working uh, with scientists, so chemists, uh, biologists. We also need to work with designers, uh, artists, the creative community, and, and really exploring this space of possible materials and re-examine the materials that we use to, to engineer our robots and build robots that are soft, that are compatible with the human body, and are safe for co-robot interaction. Okay, thanks. Can I have this? All right.